Okay. Welcome. Uh, my name is Charlene Garcia Sims, and I'm the Genealogy and Special Collections Librarian here at Rawlings. And uh, we've started a series of book talks with several authors. And today we welcome Angel Vigil again. And he was here last week uh, talking uh, about, about his book. And Angel is retired chairman of the Fine and Performing Arts Department and director of drama at Colorado Academy in Denver. He's an award-winning author, performer, stage director, and teacher. Two of his award-winning books are Corn Woman, Stories and Legends of the Hispanic Southwest, and Una Linda Raza, Cultural and Artistic Traditions of the Hispanic Southwest. And uh, Angel was with us last week, and I need to apologize because I, I kept calling his book Corn Mother because I've been so involved with the Corn Mother Project at, at Metro. So Angel, I apologize. Uh, I want them to write uh, by the right book. It is Corn Woman. So, um, and um, Corn Woman won the prestigious New York Public Library book for the Teenage National Award and, and, and it, it's very prestigious. I needed to clear this up, so uh, again, I apologize. Um, today we are going to talk about Una Linda Rosa, and this is another award-winning uh, book of Angels. Um, and it won the Border Library Association Southwest Book of the Year Award and the Colorado Book of the Year Special Recognition Award in 1998. I believe that was the year. Can you believe it's uh, uh, 20 years, Angel? And welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. I love, I love all the work I do in Pueblo. I know. Well, we love having you here. So I like to start by asking our authors, uh, what inspired you to write this book? You know, every book for any author has an origin story. And the origin story is always something personal because uh, you might walk around and like myself, I don't walk around or oh, I'm going to write this and have a particular book in mind. Right. I might have some ideas floating around. I might have some experiences floating around, but there has to be a spark, something that makes me want to commit to write this book. And the reason is writing a book is a lot of work and two things define a person's life. One is what you decide to do. And the other one is what you decide not to do. And for an artist, what defines your life is what projects are you actually going to take all the way to completion? And the other one is what ideas do you have that will never turn into art? Last week, we talked about three books I'm working on now that I've already, I have six books that I've published so far that I've written, but there's three more, almost two thirds done. I'm not certain whether I'll even finish them. So that defines a life quite a bit. What is a project that you never really finish up for one reason or another? But what are those projects that have so much drive to them, so much personal commitment to them that you actually do the hard work all the way down the road, finishing the project? So every one of my books has an origin story of what made me decide I'm not going to do those projects. I'm going to do this project finish it all the way to the end. So this book here, this one that you showed up, this book right here, I'm really proud of this book. I love this book. Won a bunch of awards, made me happy. This is why I decided to write that book. Uh, doing a lot of storytelling performances and uh, Cuentos de Aslan, stories of the homeland, Cuentos from Aslan. And what they are, they're traditional stories from uh, Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico. I'm one of the true scholars, storytellers of stories from that area. Another person, the only other person I'd recommend would be Joe Hayes. He's a New Mexico storyteller. So he also covers the same area that I do. So I'm, uh, I've am i been going around for years telling these stories at art events, at schools, at special events, at celebrations. And uh, a very common thing that would happen at the end of the event it was always around the La Llorona story. So what happened is this. I would tell a, a particular version of the La Llorona story. And my favorite audiences are elder Hispanic people. I just love them. One of the reasons is they know what I'm talking about. They grew up hearing these stories. It resonates with them very deeply. So I, it's always around the La Llorona story. So I would tell the La Llorona story. And then it was always a woman also, little old Vijita, little old lady comes walking up to me. <laughs> I can just see her face, it's beautiful. Gray hair, she didn't have the scarf on, you know, but she had the gray hair. She wasn't on a cane, but she was gingerly but slowly walking up to me. And she comes up to me and she says, Senor Vigil, 
I want to tell you, that was a very good version of La Llorona that you told. But you got the ending all wrong. And I love that moment. And then I'd actually sit down and say, come and sit down with me right here. Tell me your version. Tell me the ending of the story that you grew up listening to. And then so that let me know in, a, in the instance of La Llorona that one of the definers of a folktale that has had wide distribution in the community is that it has a lot of versions. Because that means every family, every little village, every town, every neighborhood, they had their own version. Someone else had a different version. If, if only one version exists, that means no one hardly ever told it. And it didn't evolve over time as it went from one person to another. So I love that moment of someone telling me that. But the second part of this story is, uh, and this would be elderly men and, and women, Hispanic people. They'd come up and say, oh, thank you so much for keeping the stories alive. Uh, and then they always use the same language also. I, I, I became attuned to the same language. They'd say, it's too bad it'll all be gone when we're gone. And I, I, asked, I asked people, what, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, we're the last generation that actually grew up with what you're talking about. And when we die, the younger generation is not interested in this. And this was uh, echoed to me by two people. One was Cleophas Vigil, national heritage artist, Pito player, Alvado singer from Cuesta, New Mexico. And I was interviewing him and I asked him, who, who do you tell your stories to? And he said, only white people from the university. And that made me sad because I know one time in his life he would have said, oh, I tell it to my uh, nieces and nephews. I tell it when we're at the bar. I tell it at the at the baptism. I tell it at the... He'd, he'd have a community of his relatives and an extended family and neighborhood that he'd tell stories to. But at the end of his life, the only people who wanted to hear his stories were white people from the university, meaning uh, academic researchers. And the other was Epi Archuleta, uh, the National Heritage Weaver from the San Luis Valley, from Alamosa. So I'm talking to her. We're actually driving in the car going from Alamosa to Monte Alamosa, somewhere up, up in San Luis Valley. So what happens is I ask her, uh, Epi, who do you tell your stories to? She says, almost nobody. And I said, Epi, you're a national, you're a national heritage artist. How can that be? And I said, well, when do you tell your stories? And she says, only in the car when we're driving from one town to another and no one can leave the room. So all those stories made me sad because I realized, you know what? Uh, culture can drift away. It can, it can, it can be in, combined with the dominant culture. You can lose a lot of things in a culture. And especially when these elderly people say, it's too bad, it's going to all be gone one day, meaning when they die. So that made me commit, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to go around. I, I spent two summers doing this. I'm going to go around. I'm going to talk to everybody who's old, including my own relatives. I'm going to ask them, what do you remember when you were a child? How did you do it? What were the words to the song? What did the music sound like? What's the recipe to that food? How did you make that ofrenda, that altar? And then I'd write it down. And that ended up being this book, Culture and Artistic Traditions of the Hispanic Southwest. I tell people, if it's not in this book, you don't need to know about it, okay? Because this is the Bible of my culture, the Hispanic arts and culture traditions of Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico, and all of the Hispanic Southwest. And it's, I always talk about what the uh, cultural activity is, how you do it, what the origin is, but I really wrote this also for schools and libraries and activity centers. Then every, every section has a little activity guide about how to do it in case you're teaching a younger generation. Let's, let's do this as a school activity or something. So that's how that book started and that's why I did it. Because I didn't want in my generation for these to be lost. And if someone says, you know, I, I don't even remember how we did the Entrega de la Novia. Uh, the wedding march. Uh, I better get that book and read and see what the song is and learn how to do it again. And that's the reason for this. Long story. It's a good story. Good story. <laughs> it's a good story. And um, I, I love um, how the contents, you know, you do the story, La Familia, relig religion, curanderismo, 
the arts, uh, the affairs of the world. I just love it. And I think that every school should have this in their curriculum. Is this I what you want? with you. People say they want to keep culture alive in schools. This is the guidebook for teachers. And I was a teacher for 31 years. So I know how to write activity guides for teachers. All the teacher has to do is get the uh, supplies together and follow the steps, one, two, three, four, five. And then I tried to be as thorough and complete as I could with all aspects. And I'm not trying to sell the book. People want to get it, I'm more than happy about that. The real reason for this book is to preserve history for following generations, preserve culture for following generations. So when, when some teachers say, oh, there aren't books like this, you know, I always recommend it. And, and so give her my name. <laughs> I give her my book. I do. I give them your book and I give them, I give them your name. So yeah. thank you so much for, for having, having done this book. And Rodolfo and I, and I did the, did the foreword. Oh, I think yeah. that this is funny. You see my name's real big. Mm -hmm. His name's smaller underneath mine, forward by Rodolfo Anaya. And Rodolfo Anaya, of course, is the, the grandfather of uh, Chicano literature. He's El Jefe. And then so he's responsible for generations of uh, Chicano authors that followed after him. I'm one of them. And as a joke, I told my publisher, we should have put his name in big letters and mine in small letters. We would have sold more books. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm sure that he really felt proud that you asked him to, to do the forward. Said yes, immediately, especially when I told him what the, the book was about, because he had another saying that, that I followed on also, because someone asked him, well, you can't, you can't keep everything, you know, can't you let go of the small stuff and just keep the big traditions? And I was at a panel with him talking about this, and he said, there's no tradition too small not to be kept forever. So I loved his perspective on that. I love that. I never, I never heard him say that. Yeah, but yeah. I love the entire book. But in the last ten to fifteen years, uh, we've had a surge of interest in murals here in Pueblo, and they're being painted all over town. I want to uh, mostly talk about the old ones that are classic uh, around town, especially like at Plaza Verde Park, and they're considered Chicano murals. And like I said, these are really classics. Um, how did the Chicano muralist movement start? I know you do you do a whole chapter on this. You know, I did do a chapter on this. I want to back up just a little bit because I want to read something from the book. Because And this was segue into the mural thing, how it happened and everything. Because uh, And it's related to Rodolfo and I and related to folklore and everything about there's no tradition too small. Because what, what the, the person that asked him the question, he was saying, well, why don't we just keep murals and why don't we just keep music? right, uh, old traditional songs and murals, the two big cultural traditions, maybe the dances, maybe no one does those old dances anymore. Uh, and then everything else we'll just forget about because we're Americans and we're going to go to McDonald's and eat and we're celebrating 4th of July and it, uh, who cares if they're lost and everything. And then what I felt was like Rodolfo Naya, you can't separate out the big from the small because everything contributes to everything else. I want to read about my childhood, okay? My childhood memories are filled with details of an extended family. I rem and uh, those of you that are listening, I'd like to see if this triggers any memories in your mind also. I remember going to my grandmother's farm and eating a delicious white homemade goat cheese with a heavy sweet molasses poured on it. I can hear my father singing an old joyous Spanish song at a wedding. I can taste the fresh, warm, just off the griddle jam covered tortillas my aunt made especially for me whenever I came to visit. I can feel the small hard beans under my little fingers as I sort them from one pile to another, carefully completing my childhood job of cleaning the beans by picking out the rocks before the beans are cooked. I can see my mother kneeling and praying, eyes closed, hands folded before the altar to La Virgen she kept in her bedroom. I can hear my mother sternly admonishing me not to turn around in stone in church or I turn to stone. I can hear the rustle of my sister's fancy lace white first communion dress. I can see my parents, aunts and uncles sitting around around a round kitchen table at my grandfather's house, sharing a pot of pozole with red chili, telling quintos, laughing and reminiscing about the good old days, their own childhood. I can hear the hushed droning muffled voices of my aunts saying the rosary at a velorio or wake before a funeral. I can feel my parents' warm and firm hands on my head 
as they gave me their blessings when I left home. When I think of all these memories and all these parts of culture living a boyhood in northern New Mexico, the way it leads me into the, the mural movement is two, pipes, two, two types of art. One of them is a personal family art, happens inside the house, right? Happens inside the church. There's another type of art happens outside that's a public art. And it might relate and it, it, it gains its power from the memory, of, like I just read you, of personal family memories. But the expression of it results in public art. And that, so the, the question you asked me about how Chicano Mural started, um, you got to go all the way back to the Aztecs, all right? The Aztecs, pre-conquest Mexico, before the Spanish even showed up. Uh, the Aztecs had a really large um, celebratory culture, very large artistic life, poets, painters, singers, people forget that about them. But they also had a very large uh, muralist aspect to their culture. And the Spanish, when they came in there, they're very good record keepers. They would write a lot about uh, paintings all over on walls, inside of houses and outside of houses, you know. Don't hear a lot about that, about Aztec culture. So then you have to jump forward in Mexican history a little bit. And these are the called Los Tres Grandes, the three big ones. I always write their names down. And the reason I write their names down is I want to get them correct, right? The first guy is easy, Diego Rivera. The next guy is Jose Clemente Orozco. The last guy is David Alfaro Siquerios. They're Los Tres Grandes. And in the middle, the early and middle part of the 1900s, the 20th century, uh, they brought Mexican murals to the forefront of a world art. And they were social activists. You got to put social activism together with them being the great artists that they were. So they were social activists and they used murals, large public paintings to tell the story of Mexico, to the, tell the story of Mexican history, but also to tell the story of the grievances that the underclass people in Mexico had toward their life. So this idea of combining personal feelings about a culture, being a social activist with it, combining that with, I'm gonna use my art form, I can paint large, I can paint on walls to tell a story that's important and will move people in a public way. The Chicano muralists coming out of the 1960s, they took their lead from Los Tres Grandes, the three Mexican muralists I just told you about, they took their lead from those uh, muralists about how you can use large public art paintings as a community activist, as a social activist, as a political activist, that you'd use your art forms to make a statement about a people. That's the springboard of it right there in the 1960s during the Chicano movement, which wasn't just a political movement, uh, and it wasn't like the farm workers, which was a, a unionizing movement, a labor movement. This was an artistic movement. We're going to use poetry. We're going to use music. We're going to use dance. We're going to use literature. We're going to use murals. We're going to use painting to tell the story of who we are to the public world. And the reason for that is and let, instead of letting someone else tell our story and interpret us, we will claim our own story and tell you our own story using our own artistic powers and there are artistic gifts that we have. So the muralist coming out of the Chicano movement in the 1960s, it just, psh, and uh, I talk specifically about the Chicano muralist, of course, but uh, recently we've had an explosion of mural art again. Uh, I know Denver is, is filled with muralist art and I know Pueblo, you can speak uh, more about it, uh, Charlene, than I can. A lot of public mural art in Pueblo since the killing of George Floyd uh, and the other black people associated with the Black uh, Lives Movement. Uh, cities all over the United States uh, have, have started having murals, just portrait paintings of their faces on public art to remind people of uh, why their picture's up there and, and what we're still working for toward an equal and just society in America. So I love this idea of the personal feeling about a culture, the social activism combined with public art. And one of the things I write down in the in the book is that muralism 
it's meant for ordinary people. It's you don't have to go to a museum, you don't have to pay to go see it, you don't have to buy a book to go see it, you don't have to go to a movie to go see it, you don't have to be a university professor to think about it. This is art on the wall for free outside in your normal daily life. Ordinary ordinary people have access to that art, and that's the other great power of uh, muralist art. <clears throat> So do you think the uh, enormous power of mural art is, is it's, it's a community art? You know what I love about this? <laughs> <clears throat> Let me get a drink of water. <clears throat> Tony Ortega, uh, uh, artist here in Denver, and he, he has some art in some of my books and everything. Um, this idea of it being a community art form, what I've loved a lot through the history, all the way back to the 1960s is the present day, is where the artist uh, engages community members to help paint the painting. They'll do the grid work, however they're going to do the grid work. There's a whole system of how to do it, how they do the grid work and everything. But then they have members of the community to come and help do the painting. And I see this a lot in schools in Denver because of the work of Tony Ortega. He gets hired as a muralist artist by these schools, mostly elementary schools or K through eight schools. And they'll have a wall inside the building, uh, sometimes a wall outside the building, but for him, most of the time it's inside the building. And um, they always have tile artwork that the students have done framing it. But then the image on the center of it was painted by students of the school with uh, Tony Ortega being a master artist, helping him through it and everything. And then so, the activity I actually have in Unalinda Raza, how to do a public painting, talks about this, how to uh, do the painting and then invite community members to actually help with the painting. Thank you. Um, have you run into the word consafos? And if you have, can you tell us about it? <laughs> I feel bad when people ask me questions and my daughters have always told me, Dad, just answer the question. Everything doesn't have to be a 10 minute story. And of course, they're my daughter, so they're telling me it's too boring. Just tell you, take, make it a two minute story, and move on with it. So I'm going to try to make the Consapo story a short story, okay? Um, sometimes you see this graffiti art, and the only way I can describe the lettering, it looks like old world Germanic manuscript lettering it's a very stylized type of lettering and uh, it's a c with a slash and an s and it means consafos i actually wrote a play called consafos once and it was uh the school touring play by the denver center theater company here in denver once of course it's about a bunch of teenagers and what's going on in their life and everything. But the, the name of the play was called Consafos because I was so enamored of the concept of it. And then the Denver Center, I mean, the uh, History Colorado Museum, where I work here in Denver, they have a, a display on the second floor now about El Movimiento, about the, it's about the Chicano movement in the 1960s. And they have one section there. And then I'm giving tours around the museum. And I hadn't noticed this before, actually. But as soon as I saw it, I stomped all over the museum. Who did that? I want to give him a kiss. I want to buy him chocolate. I want to send him flowers. I want to give him a bottle of tequila, whoever it is. I want to hug him for doing that. It was brilliant. On one of the panels there, in the corner, they have the C slash S, which is the way the consafos looks. And then so, uh, yeah, I'm going to sort, sort to what it looks like right now real quick. I'll just write it on this real quickly. Okay. It'll always look like that. C slash S. And the letters would be more that Germanic, uh, European, uh, medieval manuscript lettering, like Latin type lettering. I love that type of script. But the Consafos is like a lot of things in folklore has different explanations. I've actually heard three or four explanations about what consafos means and then when i would write my books people would say oh yeah 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 but uh, i don't think that's quite right and then my answer to everyone is kind of smart alecky arrogant but i really kind of mean it 
Well, then you need to do what I did. You need to write your own book with your explanation so that people have different versions to compare and follow up on or ask different people about it. I've asked people, have you ever seen the Consapos? Mainly in California, mainly around Los Angeles, if you want to know the truth. You see someone do a mural outside, big wall mural, and in the corner, they'll tag it with the Consapos, the C slash S. And my interpretation of that, that several muralists have told me about, so I'm following their lead, right? Chicano muralist. It's kind of like a talisman symbol. It's like a protective symbol. It's not a, a good luck thing like that or anything. It's a talisman of, or perspective. It's almost untranslatable, con, what consafos means. It's more of a feeling. It's more of a spirit. It's more of an idea. And what they do, they draw the big mural, and then they would tag it with the consafos. And that was a warning to other graffiti artists or other taggers. If you come and deface my mural, it's kind of like the ojo, the evil eye. Well, then the evil you brought to my mural, now protected by the consafos, would just be reflected back on you. So that's what I mean about it being a protective talisman that uh, graffiti artists in Los Angeles would put. I haven't seen it very, very much around Colorado or Denver, but I have seen it a lot on murals in Los Angeles. So that's the story of the Consafos, my version of the story of the Consafos. And that only took five minutes. Hey, hey, I'm getting Tell better. Your Tell your daughter that. I'm <laughs> down the, to first five time, minutes. the first time I, I heard Consafos or, or the story was from um, Jose Berciaga. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's what he talked about. It, it, and it kind of means respect. respect you, cannot, right. you cannot tag this. You cannot tag this because, you know, you're going to get bad karma or, or karma you're, you're, come back at you. you're just not going to be looked you know, upon as, as, you know, you're just going to get in trouble if you do this, if you have right, it. Right. Yet. So it was wonderful. And, and that's where I heard it first, but sure, thank sure. you. That was, that was a good story. Make, t make sure you tell your daughter it was only five minutes. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On page 174, you say that the Chicano mural was a public folk art. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this and, and the purpose of, of uh, murals. You know, um, this idea of a public folk art, I, I, I referred to it previously that it's free. I love the idea that it's free. Uh, free to observe, not free to do, because someone's got to buy the paint, someone's got to give you permission to paint on the wall. Lot, there's a, In Denver here, we have a, a, the city supports some of the muralists around Denver. If you walk along the Cherry Creek River, right around in the Lodo area from Lodo, maybe, I don't know, halfway to Cherry Creek, you got to be down by the river, walking on the river sidewalk itself below the, the grade of the road. So you have to access the walk right by the river. Loaded the murals all the way down there. And there are notifications there called Urban Arts. And those are that's a place where artists can apply for funding to do a mural. I love the murals along the Cherry Creek uh, Riverbed here in Denver. So the idea that it's a folk art, uh, the idea of Folk, nowadays it's, it's done a lot by uh, specialists, okay? So I want to separate folk art out from specialist art. And now I'm like the academician and the, giving a the lecture in the college class. Folk art was uh, traditionally done by people who would never have called themselves a folk artist. This is another story. My, my mom and I, we get into active discussions between a mom and a son when she started what I was doing, right? She didn't think I should tell a lot of the stories. She really didn't like uh, Santos or Retablos being sold at the Spanish market in New Mexico. She thought it was flat out sacrilegious and that it shouldn't be sold as art. She hated that it was stuck in a museum. And of course, she lived to be 92. She, she lived a childhood of someone from 300 years ago. She had a very, very old world Hispanic version of cultural art and devotional art and everything. She thought they were holy objects that should be in your house or the church. That's the only places they should be. Not for sale at the market, not for sale at the fair, not for sale at the store. She just thought it was sacrilegious. Some of my stories, she would tell me, oh, you shouldn't tell that story, why? 
well, it's just not a story to be told in public. That was the only reason, you know. And then I asked her about this. Did every did anyone in your family when you were growing up tell stories? Oh yeah, they told stories quite a bit. Did anyone ever call themselves a conquista, a storyteller? She gave me the weird look. No, why would they do that? They're farmers. They were sheep herders. Uh, they worked on the railroad. They worked in the coal mines. Uh, that's who they were. They weren't a conquista. And then I asked them about the people that would carve these devotional carvings, either the Tablas or Santos. Did they ever call themselves a Santero? No, we never called them a Santero. That was like uh, Tio Joe. He was a sheep herder. So the idea that, that in folk art, uh, coming from any culture, these are just people who made the objects they needed in their life, because they didn't go to a store to buy this object. If they wanted an object, someone in the community had to make it. So that's a very narrow, but pretty good definition of true folk art. Not someone who went to college, not someone who trained to make this, not someone who spent a lifetime making this, not someone who made it for sale, right? They made objects for their personal and family and community use. What has happened to muralists over time, a lot of them now, they're like trained artists. That's why the murals look so fantastic. They practice, they've either gone to school. The only people who aren't like that are the taggers, just these junior high and high school kids that are just, they pra I've seen them, they practice their script, they practice their tag, because I've asked them, let me see your notebook, let me see your tag and stuff where you practice. I've been tra practicing my script, I've been practicing my tag. Uh, do it at night when no one's seeing me or anything, you know. Nowadays, they, they get hired to do a mural and they want everyone to come and watch them and engage the community. So muralist art in the present day has evolved quite a bit about who does it, how it's done, but it's still a public art that's free for anybody who wants to come and observe it. Thank you for um, all the information that you've given us. And uh, my colleague Megan, who's running all the all the buttons here, and uh, she's she's a little shy today. Uh, we had a Megan, couple of reasons. Megan, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of reasons to concentrate on the mural chapter of your book because we wanted yeah. to promote uh, one of our pride and joy murals. This is called Absolutely. Corazón de Pueblo by David Osialto uh, Garcia. And uh, in 2008, when when I uh, arrived here at the, at this library. I, I took care of the Hispanic Resource Center, and there was a blank wall, and I couldn't see a blank wall. I saw, I saw, can't have a I saw, wall. I saw a mural, and I wanted um, to somehow tell the story of uh, Spanish Mexican uh, history in, in in Pueblo, and so the Colorado Humanities came to us and offered us grant money, but we had to write a grant. So with the support of our director, uh, I wrote a grant, and we got a grant to have a scholar write the history. And Dr. David Sandoval was available. So he wrote this, Spanish Mexican Legacy of Latinos in Pueblo County. And this is through the, through the grant from the, you know, the Colorado Humanities. And then we were able to do the mural based on his, on his book. So it's our pride and joy. And it's on the second floor of the Rawlings Library. And it has a legend on the back which is really cool. And this is for sale. So this is why we're, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about murals, other than murals are, are wonderful. And they, ha they haven't always been positive and now they're just becoming so popular and positive. And- I, I um, think there's been a resurgence in interest in mural art throughout the country, which I think is just wonderful. It is, I can't imagine painting, you know, something, you know, so, so big. So the second reason is that in September, uh, Megan, our museum coordinator, who's also an artist, uh, will, be will be presenting the murals of Anthony Armijo. All he has about, oh my gosh, I don't know, 15 murals around Pueblo. And each one tells a story. And, and we're sad to say that Anthony passed away last month, but his heart is, is gonna live forever in his murals. And getting back to murals, isn't that what happens with murals, Angel? Absolutely, Mural, murals just, I think one of the saddest things that can happen is when whoever owns a building decides to repurpose the building and paint over a mural, it's like burning a book in my in my estimation, you know. Uh, murals are outside, they should be forever, they should be touched up because they get weathered, you know, because they're outside. But murals, uh, I love them 
they should have a permanence to them, even though most of the time they don't because they need to be refreshed. And they, whenever someone pays, pays for a mural and they're writing a grant, I always encourage them, you have to add into your original grant maintenance of the mural because the mural always needs refreshing over time. But I'm totally with you about their, their continuing uh, positive effects on the life and culture of a community. Well, I was afraid when I said I wanted the, a, a mural painted on a wall, I was afraid that they might paint over it. So uh, I had seen an example of Carlos Frescas's art in, at the library, and he did it in, in three panels. So David uh, Garcia did it in three panels. So they can't paint over it. <laughs> I've seen murals painted over. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking oh. to see the mural painted over. It's infuriating. It breaks no, they, your they, spirit for a while. So, they uh, cannot do it or there will be bad karma. <laughs> put the consapos on it for sure. Yeah, put the CF on there. <laughs> you know what? That's what I'm going to do when I leave here. Oh, I'm going to go to the second floor put a little on CS on there. <laughs> But thank you once again, Angel, for joining us. And I want to thank our audience for joining us for all our virtual uh, programs. And, and please continue doing that. Uh, keep looking at our live programs, and especially in September for um, Hispanic Heritage Month. And um, we just may have Angel back, and we may just have him talk about, do a little tribute to uh, to Rodolfo Anaya, uh, the grandfather of, of Chicano literature. Thank so you. thank you, Angel, thank once you. again. You. and. Uh, Thanks. Any last any any last words from you? Yes, thank you for bringing that whole mural to the library. Way to go! Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's it's just yeah. really wonderful. Like and like I said, you know, CS. I'm gonna go put CS on there <laughs> because they cannot. <laughs> and then I not remember watching both to buy the book about the, the the history of Pueblo, and then as soon as libraries are open for full access again, go by and look at the mural, and. Uh, Pay as much attention to it as you would to the Mona Lisa over in, in uh, France. Spend time with it, sit back, look at the legend. Murals have a lot of a narrative density to them. That's the other thing I like about them. There's a lot of story inside there and you gotta give it time to come to become immersed inside of it. And the, and the Mona Lisa is little, beautiful, little, yeah. and, but, and the mural is, is huge. And, um, I hope no. I hope if anybody sees the CS on the mural, nobody will tell them who did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a good evening, everybody. Hey, 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 say, oh, that angel guy snuck up here and did it without permission. Put it on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye.